Good evening, it's Monday, April 25th. The United Nations calls for a ceasefire in the Ukrainian city of Mariupol to create a safe safe humanitarian corridor for the 2,000 people holed up in a steel plant to be able to flee. Russia has said it will create such a corridor, but Ukrainian officials say they will only trust a passage negotiated and backed by the United Nations. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signs a bill today to create a police force dedicated to pursuing voter fraud and other election crimes after former President Donald Trump's false claims that his re-election was stolen. A Kansas district court judge strikes down a new Republican-backed congressional map that would likely make it harder for the only Democrat in the state's congressional delegation to win re-election this year. Elon Musk reaches an agreement to buy Twitter for roughly $44 billion today, promising a more lenient touch to policing content on the social media platform where he, the world's richest person, promotes his interests, attacks critics, and opines on a wide range of issues to more than 83 million followers. Latino members of Congress urged President Biden to hold fast to a promise to end a controversial measure that lets the U.S. turn back migrants at the Mexican border despite fierce Republican anti-immigrant attacks. And a New York judge finds former President Trump in contempt of court for failing to adequately respond to a subpoena issued by the state's attorney general and orders Trump to pay a fine of $10,000 a day. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, This is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin took a secret trip to Ukraine this weekend to meet with President Volodymyr Zelensky. They pledged to provide more than $300 million in foreign military financing and said they had approved a $165 million sale of ammunition. Blinken told reporters today near the Polish-Ukrainian border that Russia is losing the war. We're seeing that when it comes to Russia's war aims, Russia is failing, Ukraine is succeeding. Russia has sought as its principal aim to totally subjugate Ukraine, to take away its sovereignty, to take away its independence. That has failed. It sought to assert the power of its military and its economy. We, of course, are seeing just the opposite. A military that is dramatically underperforming, an economy uh, as a result of sanctions, as a result of a mass exodus from Russia that is in shambles. Uh, And it sought to divide the West and NATO. Of course, we're seeing exactly the opposite. The Biden administration is planning to send more high-level officials to Ukraine. The visit and pledge for additional arms has riled Moscow, which is increasingly blaming the West for starting the war with an attack on Russia. Russia's President Vladimir Putin's comments translated by Al Jazeera. The other task is coming forward to break Russia from within, but they can't do it because our society is showing its unity and support our armed forces and our efforts to maintain the security of Russia and the citizens of Donbass. Putin's comments came as two Russian naval vessels arrived on Finland's coast to engage in wartime exercises. Finland is considering joining NATO, a move that Russia has warned against. The UK's Guardian newspaper is reporting Sweden and Finland have agreed to submit application to join NATO at the same time. They'll be making the announcement next month in May during the Finnish president's visit to Stockholm, Sweden. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky hailed 
his Sunday talks with U.S. Secretary of State Blinken and U.S. Defense Secretary Austin as encouraging and effective. Speaking in today's video address, he said the U.S. is offering powerful support to his country. Zelensky added they had agreed on further steps to strengthen the armed forces of Ukraine and meet all the priority needs of its army. He noted that ramping up sanctions against Moscow was also on the meeting's agenda. Blinken and Austin said the United States had approved a $165 million sale of ammunition for Ukraine's war effort, along with more than $300 million in foreign military financing. John Pfeffer of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, Director of Foreign Policy and Focus, told Brian Edwards Tinkert of the Upfront Morning Program that the nature of the weapons that the U.S. and its allies are now supplying to Ukraine has changed as the war has gone on. They also double as offensive weaponry? That's correct. Um, the initial aid packages were modest and uh, again, the kind of over all concern was to demonstrate that NATO countries and the United States in particular were not crossing the line. In other words, uh, getting involved in the conflict in any um, serious way, in a, in a way to, uh, to bring NATO in direct confrontation with Russia. Uh, but that has changed uh, over the course of the war, in part because of um, uh, the the length of the war, um, uh, any expectation that either Russia would win immediately or lose immediately uh, has been scotched, and therefore, you know, uh, the calculations have changed. But also demands coming from Ukraine and a perception that um, that uh, Ukraine could successfully use these weapons to uh, to really uh, either effectively stalemate Russian forces or win the conflict outright. In other words, force Russia to withdraw completely from the country. I think the the decision of Russian forces to focus on the Donbass, to move away from uh, Kiev, has uh, has really bolstered the the uh, the demands and. NATO countries to deliver more effective weaponry to Ukraine. Um, now, of course, Russia has responded that this is unacceptable, uh, that this is um, uh, something that has justified its continued bombing, for instance, of uh, Western Ukraine and going after the uh, the transit points for military aid coming into Ukraine. Um, but to so far, it hasn't led to uh, any other escalations outside of Ukraine. Um, so I think NATO, to a certain extent, has been emboldened to deliver those military um, that military weaponry because it has not led to any uh, further uh, steps toward direct confrontation between NATO and Russian forces. John Pfeffer is Director of Foreign Policy in Focus. Ukraine said today that the United Nations should step in to oversee an evacuation route for civilians from the besieged steel mill in Mariupol in southern Ukraine, which is Ukrainian troops' last stronghold in the port city. Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vereshchuk said on the Telegram messaging app that a Russian announcement of a humanitarian corridor out of the Azovstal plant today was was not agreed to by Ukraine. Vereshuk added that Ukraine does not consider the route safe and said Russia had breached agreements on similar evacuation routes before. Ukrainian officials have said up to a thousand civilians have been sheltering at the sprawling steel plant. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is scheduled to visit Russia and Ukraine this week. Vereshuk called on Guterres to be the initiator and guarantor of a humanitarian route out of the steel plant 
and for United Nations and Red Cross personnel to accompany any Ukrainian evacuees. Farhan Haq is deputy spokesperson for the United Nations. The lives of tens of thousands of people, including children and the elderly, are at stake in Mariupol. Hostilities in Ukraine are escalating, causing more civilian casualties, impacting key civilian infrastructure across the country, and hampering aid to people stranded in areas with intense fighting, including Mariupol and Kherson. Across the country and since the war began, the World Health Organization has confirmed more than 160 attacks against health facilities and the UN Human Rights Office has confirmed that 2,400 civilians have been killed. The actual figures are likely to be much higher. Farhan Haq for the United Nations. Meanwhile, Russia's representatives to the United Nations is accusing Ukraine of planning to use chemical weapons, including at its nuclear power plant, with help from the United States. Dmitry Polyansky spoke at the United Nations this morning. The situation is very alarming. There are three possible scenarios of this. The first one is a stage incident under a false flag and actual use of chemical or biological weapons resulting in casualties among the civilians. Another option, a staged so-called Russian sabotage at those facilities in Ukraine where components of weapons of mass destruction were produced. We have reasons to believe that this is exactly what, what Kyiv regime and its sponsors are planning to do at the chemical and biological facilities in Kyiv and Kharkov. There can also be provocations at the nuclear energy facilities, in particular Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, controlled by the Russian Federation. Russia's representative at the United Nations, Dmitry Polyansky. U.S. and Ukrainian officials have long warned Russia would try to blame Ukraine for such an attack that Russia would actually carry out. The International Criminal Court's Prosecution Office is joining a joint investigation team set up by Ukraine, Lithuania, and Poland to probe atrocities committed during the war in Ukraine. The ICC ICC's prosecutor Karim Khan signed an agreement today to participate in the multinational effort that aims to facilitate investigations and cooperation. Eurojust, the European Union's Judicial Cooperation Agency, says the agreement sends a clear message that all efforts will be undertaken to effectively gather evidence on core international crimes committed in Ukraine and bring those responsible to justice. Environmental campaigners used kayaks and a dinghy to stop a Russian oil tanker from unloading its cargo south of Norway's capital, saying Norwegian companies are financing Russia's warfare. Greenpeace says its members chained themselves to the Hong Kong registered UST Luga leased by Russian oil company Novatec as it arrived at its destination at Esso's terminal near Tonsberg. The tanker with 95,000 tons of fuel had left St. Petersburg. An Esso spokeswoman told Norwegian newspapers that the oil had been bought before Russia invaded Ukraine. She added that Esso Norway does not have other contracts for the purchase of products from Russia. France's Emmanuel Macron has done something no other French president has achieved before, winning re-election while still being in charge of his own government. The centrist president's victory over Marine Le Pen may have been convincing, but he has a problem. There are new elections around the corner to France's National Assembly, and a big section of the electorate dislikes him. Most world leaders, though, certainly welcomed his victory. Rosie Bouchard reports from Brussels. Emmanuel Macron's re-election has been welcomed in many capitals around the world. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi says he looks forward to deepening partnership with France under Macron's leadership. US President Joe Biden noted France is his country's oldest ally and cited fighting climate change and defending democracy as some of the challenges he hopes to try and tackle alongside President Macron. And from his war-torn nation, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky called Macron a true friend of Ukraine. 
In Brussels, Macron's win means more than just continuity. Challenger Marine Le Pen is famous for her Eurosceptic views, and some suggest that a Le Pen presidency would mean the end of the European Union. Rosie Bruchard reporting from Brussels, Belgium. Macron won his additional five-year term on Sunday in a runoff election against far-right opponent Marine Le Pen. Macron got 58% of the vote, Le Pen 41%. But that was the best result for a French far-right presidential candidate so far. In a victory speech last night, Macron told voters who supported him not out of conviction for his policies, but more out of a desire to defeat Le Pen, that he recognizes their their concerns. I also know full well that many people tonight voted for me not to support my ideals, but to block the far right. And I want to thank them tonight. I want to tell them that I understand the duty that comes with that vote for the coming years. I have been entrusted with their sense of duty, their feelings for the Republic, and for the differences that have been expressed over the last weeks. Macron's next major challenge would be to try and unite a deeply divided France. 28% of French voters did not go to the polls. That's the highest percentage of people who declined to vote in a presidential election since 1969. Macron said he will reach out to those who voted against him or didn't vote at all. He also promised to listen more to those who disagree with him. During the campaign, he was criticized for being aloof and arrogant toward his critics. Marine Le Pen said her party's loss is a kind of victory considering its unprecedented results. She said she will now focus on the upcoming parliamentary elections scheduled for June. Instead of having the power in the hands of few, I will fight to bring power to the hands of the French people. I will do so with steadfast determination that you have seen me put into motion these past few years. Following this campaign, following this camp, we see that the great political stage that we have been operating on is undergoing great change. With the self-proclaimed elite of Macron's political parties, they are now going to have to face up against true opposition. Because in a few weeks' time, we will face the legislative elections, and we will be there. Leftist leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was narrowly knocked out in the first round of voting with a third-place finish, asked French voters to fight against Macron's party in the parliamentary elections in June. I'm asking the French people to elect me as their prime minister by voting for a majority of MPs from the France Unbound Party and our popular union group. There is a third round to come. Not only a second round, but also a third. Mm -hmm. Macron is to visit Berlin to meet with German leaders. It's a tradition for the newly elected French president to make their first foreign trip to Germany to celebrate the country's friendship after multiple wars against each other. Macron may also travel to Kiev to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to discuss the crisis there. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. CNN has obtained 2,319 text messages that former President Donald Trump's White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, sent and received between Election Day 2020 and President Joe Biden's January 20th, 2021 inauguration. The vast trove of text, which Meadows selectively provided to the House Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, offers the most revealing picture to date of how Trump's inner circle, supporters, and Republican lawmakers worked behind the scenes to try to overturn the election results, and then reacted to the violence that effort unleashed at the Capitol on January 6th. 
The never-before-seen texts include messages from Trump's family, daughter Ivanka Trump, son-in-law Jared Kushner, and son Donald Trump Jr., as well as White House and campaign officials, cabinet members, Republican Party leaders, January 6th rally organizers, Rudy Giuliani, My Pillow Guy, Mike Lindell, Sean Hannity, and other Fox hosts. There are also text messages with more than 40 current and former Republican members of Congress, including Senator Ted Cruz of Texas and Congress members Jim Jordan of Ohio, Mo Brooks of Alabama, and Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia. Green, who has repeatedly defended those who stormed the Capitol, appeared to have done so on the morning of January 7th in a text message with Meadows as well. Green later advocated for President Trump to institute martial law in order to stay in office. She wrote on January 17th, In our private chat with only members, several are saying the only way to save our republic is for Trump to call for martial law. This past Friday, Green testified under oath that she could not recall discussing martial law. She gave similar responses about several questions pertaining to the January 6th insurrection. Jonah Chester reports. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Georgia Republican, was in court Friday fending off charges of insurrection. I I was asking people to come for a peaceful march, which is what everyone is entitled to do under their First Amendment. But I was not asking them to actively engage in violence or any type of action. Citing her inflammatory social media messages, a coalition of her constituents argue Green violated the Constitution by collaborating with insurrectionists on January 6th. A guilty verdict could bar her from holding office. Green says she still believes the big lie that widespread voter fraud cost Donald Trump the 2020 election. In related news, leaked audio reveals House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy planned to encourage the former president to resign following the insurrection. In a recorded call obtained by the New York Times, McCarthy tells his fellow Republicans that Trump, quote, bears responsibilities for his words and actions, no ifs, ands, or buts, unquote, and that the president had acknowledged some responsibility for the attack. McCarthy has been publicly loyal to Trump, and the former president says his relationship with the minority leader is still positive in spite of the leak. But the revelation could make it difficult for McCarthy to become speaker if Republicans win the most seats this fall. I'm Jonah Chester for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren called minority leader McCarthy a traitor and a liar after that audio recording of him went public last week planning on encouraging then-President Trump to resign from office and then denying it. Speaking on CNN State of the Union yesterday, Warren blasted McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy is a liar and a traitor. Uh, This is outrageous. And that is really the the illness that that pervades the Republican leadership right now. That they say one thing to the American public and something else in private. They understand that it is wrong what happened, an attempt to overthrow our government, uh, and that the Republicans instead want to continue to try to figure out how to make 2020 election different instead of spending their energy on how it is that we go forward in order to build an economy, in order to make this country work better for the people who sent us to Washington. Shame on Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy has had a positive telephone conversation with Trump since the audio recording came out. McCarthy stands to be House Speaker if Democrats lose their majority this fall after midterm elections. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill today to create a police force dedicated to pursuing voter fraud and other election crimes, embracing a top priority of Republicans after former President Trump's false claims that his re-election was stolen. The new law comes after the Republican governor made voting legislation a focus this year, pushing the Republican-controlled State House to create the policing unit as states reevaluate their own election systems in the wake of Trump's unfounded allegations. 
DeSantis, who is running for re-election and is widely considered to be a potential 2024 presidential candidate, has both praised the last election as smooth and suggested more rules were needed to defer fraud, underscoring Trump's lingering influence if not stranglehold on Republican policymaking. At a bill signing ceremony today at a sports bar in Spring Hill, Florida, DeSantis justified the need for the new law enforcement unit and suggested that existing law enforcement may not be equipped or willing to thoroughly investigate fraud cases. Voter fraud is rare, typically occurs in isolated instances, and is generally detected. An Associated Press investigation of the 2020 presidential election found fewer than 475 potential cases of voter fraud out of 25.5 million ballots cast in the six states where Trump and his allies disputed the election loss to Biden. Republicans nationwide have passed numerous voting laws in the past two years aimed at placing new restrictions around mail and early voting methods that were popular in 2020. Tramel Gomes reports. Governor Ron DeSantis has been confronting a lot of issues dealing with race and inclusion. The latest is his signing into law his version of Florida's new congressional district maps, which heavily benefits Republicans and slashes the number of black districts in half, from four to two. DeSantis claims those districts were racially gerrymandered, but his proposed race-neutral map caused a sit-in protest by mostly black lawmakers in the Florida House at the end of the redistricting special session. Here's Representative Angie Nixon, a Democrat from Jacksonville. Ron DeSantis is disrespectful. Ron DeSantis is a bully. Yep. Ron DeSantis does not care about black people. I will not bite my tongue. He, there is an incessant attack on black people in the state of Florida. Florida. The League of Women Voters of Florida and a number of Democratic-aligned redistricting groups filed suit the same day the governor signed his maps into law. The League successfully challenged the state during the last redistricting process, and its president now vows to fight for the voters and voices of hundreds of thousands of black voters. The DeSantis administration also stirred controversy when it announced a ban of 54 of 132 math textbooks it said included references to critical critical race theory, and other prohibited topics, but offered no details. Bacardi Jackson with the Southern Poverty Law Center says she thinks it's ongoing pushback from the Black Lives Matter movement that sparked conversations about the impact of systemic and structural racism. Um, we seem to be in an era and a moment that says white supremacy now, white supremacy always. We will resist every effort to make our society diverse. We will resist every effort. Jackson filed a public records request for administration to reveal its criteria for rejecting books. The Department of Education only lists four examples on its website and is unclear about specific concerns. DeSantis has long pledged to take a stand against what he calls state-sanctioned racism. And on Friday, he signed into law what he calls the Stop Woke Act, which restricts how race is discussed in schools, colleges, and workplaces. DeSantis also signed a bill just days after it was introduced, revoking the Walt Disney Company's special district status in the state. Attorney Daniel Ufelder is a former Republican turned Democratic activist and candidate for attorney general. He says the move is reckless. That seems to be a pattern with the leadership we have where they make these very quick, rash, impulsive decisions when someone or something does something that they don't agree with. And that is a dangerous precedent. Tax experts and legislators say eliminating the district could have unintended consequences for county taxpayers, underscoring Ufelder's point that the decision needed the careful analysis of experts, not a surprise issue for lawmakers in a special session to address congressional redistricting. This is Tremel Gomes for Florida News Connection. A Kansas district court judge today struck down a new Republican-backed congressional map that would likely make it harder 
matter, if not impossible, for the only Democrat in the state's delegation of, to Congress to win re-election this year. It's the first time a court has declared that the Kansas Constitution prohibits political gerrymandering. The state attorney general's office notified the Kansas Supreme Court almost immediately to expect an appeal of the decision. Lawsuits over new congressional district lines have proliferated across the U.S., with Republicans looking to recapture a House majority in this year's midterm elections. State courts have issued decisions favoring Democrats in North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and a new Republican map in Florida is being challenged. A mid-level appeals court in New York recently declared its new district's were drawn unfairly to favor Democrats. Today's decision from Wyandotte County District Judge Bill Clapper is the, in the Kansas City area came a little more than five weeks before the state's June 1st candidate filing deadline. Good government groups are pushing back against a bill requiring voters in New Hampshire to fill out a ballot which could later be thrown out. If they are missing documentation when they register to vote for the first time on Election Day, Lily Bolke reports. Currently, Granite Staters can sign an affidavit attesting their identity if they are missing needed documents. They need both a state ID to prove identity and age and a passport, birth certificate, or naturalization document to prove citizenship. If they do not follow up with the documentation later, they can be investigated for fraud. Proponents say the bill is for security, but audits have found no evidence of widespread voter fraud. And Liz Tenterelli with the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire says this bill is a proposed solution to a problem that doesn't exist. I think people would be really surprised if they said, well, yes, we have same-day voter registration, but you must have these documents. You have approved identity, age, where you live, and citizenship. How many people carry citizenship papers around with them? Tenterelli notes only people who are registering for the first time on Election Day would need to fill out these affidavit ballots, which she notes are essentially provisional ballots. The legislation's been passed by the state Senate and is now before the House. She adds the bill also raises privacy concerns because it's such a small number of people who would have to fill out provisional ballots and clerks would have to go through and invalidate the ones from people who didn't follow up with documentation. Where is the privacy of that ballot? And the sponsor said, well, if that person voted fraudulently, all rights of privacy are canceled. Well, did that person vote fraudulently or did that person just become a normal person and forget to do something within the time limit? Republican Governor Chris Sununu has expressed hesitation about the bill, saying it might delay results and that New Hampshire's election system works. New Hampshire is currently one of a handful of states that don't use provisional ballots. Provisional ballots are required by federal law, but the state got an exemption for having same-day voter registration at the time of the passage of the National Voter Registration Act of 1993. This is Lily Wolke with New Hampshire News Connection. Since the 2020 election, a growing number of election workers have been threatened, harassed, spat upon. Tomorrow, the California Senate Judiciary Committee will hear a bill that would allow election workers to hide their home addresses from public view. Suzanne Potter reports. Senate Bill 1131 would allow election workers to join the Safe at Home program, which was created 20 years ago to make it harder for perpetrators of domestic violence to track down their victims. Kim Alexander is president and co-founder of the California Voter Foundation, a co-sponsor of the bill. There are still a number of people who make false claims about the election being stolen, and the election officials and their staff are on the receiving end of the big lie. SB 1131 also would change an old state law that required poll workers' names to be posted at polling sites. Next, it is expected to head to the Senate Appropriations Committee. Alexander says 15 percent of the county registrars of voters in the Golden State left their jobs after the last presidential contest. Election officials are overworked, understaffed, underpaid, and now find themselves under attack. The Brennan Center for Justice, the other co-sponsor of the bill, recently conducted a nationwide survey of nearly 600 election officials. Alexander notes that one in six reported having been threatened because of his or her job. Over half reported they are concerned about the safety of their colleagues. More than one in four are concerned about being assaulted on the job, and 20 percent plan to leave their jobs before the 2024 election. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Foundation of New York. 
for California News Service. I'm Suzanne Potter. This is the evening news. It's an hour-long newscast without an eruption airing each weekday night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. I'm Mark Miracle. A New York judge has found former President Donald Trump in contempt of court for failing to adequately respond to a subpoena issued by the state attorney general as part of a civil investigation into his business dealings. Judge Arthur Engeron today ordered Trump to pay a fine of $10,000 a day. New York Attorney General Letitia James, a Democrat, had asked the court to hold Trump in contempt after he missed a March 31st court-imposed deadline to turn over documents. Trump has been fighting James in court over her investigation, which he has called a politically motivated witch hunt. Trump's spokespeople did not immediately respond to requests for comment after the judge's ruling today. Elon Musk reached an agreement to buy Twitter for roughly $44 billion today, promising a more lenient touch to policing content on the social media platform, where he, the world's richest man, promotes his interests, attacks critics, and opines on a wide range of issues to more than 83 million followers. The outspoken Tesla CEO has said he wants to own and privatize Twitter because he thinks it's not living up to its potential as a platform for free speech. Musk said in a joint statement with Twitter that he wants to make the service better than ever with new features while getting rid of automated spam accounts and making its algorithms open to the public to increase trust. The more hands-off approach to content moderation that Musk envisions has many users concerned that the platform would become more of a haven for disinformation, hate speech, and bullying, something it has worked hard in recent years to mitigate. Wall Street analysts said if it goes too far, it could also alienate advertisers. The deal was cemented roughly two weeks after the billionaire first revealed a 9% stake in the platform. Musk said last week that he had lined up $46.5 billion in financing to buy Twitter putting pressure on the company's board to negotiate a deal. Twitter said the transaction was unanimously approved by its board of directors. Ira Spitzer has more. The world's richest man will now control the influential social media network pending regulatory approval after Twitter's board agreed to accept Elon Musk's offer to buy the company at a price of $54.20 a share or about $44 billion. Musk says he intends to make Twitter a private company and allow more of what he calls free speech on the platform. That's drawn praise from some conservatives who have accused Twitter of bias for actions such as banning former U.S. President Donald Trump. However, many others have expressed concern about Musk's content moderation plans or lack thereof. Ira Spitzer, San Francisco. Latino lawmakers today urged President Biden to hold fast to a promise to end a controversial measure that lets the United States turn back migrants at the Mexican border. Critics have blasted the Trump-era action, saying it keeps refugees from filing valid claims for asylum while doing little to achieve its aim of addressing the coronavirus pandemic. The policy is currently set to end on May 23rd. Christopher Martinez reports. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus is urging the Biden administration to hold firm on its promise to roll back a Trump-era measure that allows border expulsions during the pandemic. Seven leaders of the 38-member caucus met with President Joe Biden for a scheduled 30-minute meeting that ended up lasting more than an hour. Democratic Representative Raul Ruiz of California is chair of the caucus. He says the face of the pandemic has changed, and he says we're in a different position now than we were in the past. There's ample vaccines available. There is the ability to test and quarantine that work. Uh, And so Title 42 uh, should uh, uh, be lifted uh, and that we should focus on border management policy in order to make sure that they have the resources in order to move forward. 
Title 42 is a public health measure that allows border authorities to turn back migrants because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was first invoked by then-President Donald Trump in March 2020, to the dismay of critics who say the action is ineffective in addressing the pandemic, unfairly harms asylum seekers, and scapegoats immigrants. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus made it very clear that the Title 42 policy is a public health emergency policy that was instituted under the Trump administration during his hate and fear anti-immigrant agenda. Democrat Nanette Barragan of California was the caucus's point person on Title 42 at the meeting. She says it went well. Um, and we also asked uh, the president of the administration to work with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, so that we can be partners, so that we do everything we can to support this administration in a successful um, implementation of removing that, um, that uh, public health authority. Again, it's a public health authority, not an immigration one. And, um, and we, uh, I think, received a very positive feedback. Title 42 is likely to be one of the main Republican talking points in the upcoming midterm elections. Even as Biden was meeting with the caucus, Republican lawmakers were making a visit to the Mexican border in Texas. But that issue was not the only topic for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. They also argued for things like temporary protected status for immigrants from some Latin American and Caribbean countries, extending the DACA program for undocumented youths brought to the U.S. as children, student debt relief, and the need for broader immigration reform. Representative Ruiz says there's a common theme there, and he holds high hopes for action from the Biden administration. So overall, the executive orders and actions presented will inspire younger generations to engage with us and the Biden administration, empower them, and send a clear message that they are not forgotten. No son olvidados. Title 42 is set to expire on May 23rd. The White House has reportedly invited congressional staff to a virtual briefing on the issue Tuesday. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The American Civil Liberties Union of Kentucky said it remains unclear whether women seeking abortions after 15 weeks are protected from penalties. After a federal judge issued an emergency order late last week blocking a new state law from going into effect. Nadia Ramlagan reports. House Bill 3 temporarily went on the books after state Republican lawmakers overrode Governor Andy Bashir's veto, meaning people who needed abortions couldn't obtain them for eight days. Kentucky State Director for Planned Parenthood Tamara Weeder says patients with appointments suddenly had to make plans to travel out of state. Kentuckians are put in an unspeakable situation. Those who had abortions scheduled were not able to have them in Kentucky and they had to seek care outside of the state. House Bill 3 virtually eliminates abortion access by including a deluge of requirements that providers currently are unable to comply with, including obtaining registration to supply medication abortion. The bill also includes a ban on abortion after 15 weeks, before many women even realize they're pregnant. Weeder adds that while she welcomes the restraining order, the legal tactics deployed in House Bill 3 are a serious legal blow to reproductive rights in the Commonwealth. And so the last eight days, we saw Kentucky without abortion access, which was the first state in 49 years to see the loss of access to abortion care. She also points out the myriad restrictions outlined in the bill would impact low-income and black and brown communities the most. Those who have means will always be able to find a way to get an abortion. And those with lesser means in rural parts of the state without transportation are going to be disproportionately impacted by these types of bans. According to the Guttmacher Institute, so far nationwide, lawmakers in 41 states have introduced more than 500 abortion restrictions. This is Nadia Ramlagan for Kentucky News Connection. A Texas appeals court today delayed the execution of Melissa Lucio amid growing doubts about whether she fatally beat her two-year-old daughter. Lucio's efforts to hold her execution has garnered the support of lawmakers, celebrities, and even some of the jurors who had sentenced her to death. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals granted a request by Lucio's lawyers for a stay so a lower court can review her claims that new evidence would exonerate her. It was not immediately known when the lower court might begin reviewing her case. Lucio had been set for lethal injection on Wednesday for the 2007 death of her daughter Mariah.
You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno. Online, kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story, or an idea, or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. Amazon workers rallied in Staten Island, New York Sunday in support of an upcoming vote on whether its warehouse LDJ5 will join the Amazon Labor Union. Derek Palmer with the ALU. We have to take this power and we got to take it to Jeff Bezos' office and we got to let him know that we mean business. We're not playing with y'all anymore. We've woken the country up and I want us to continue on this, on this, this, uh, this journey and I want us to win LDJ5. LDJ5 has been busting their ass, organizing day in and day out. And we need to support them. And also, we need to support all the Amazon facilities around the world who want to organize as well. Jeff Bezos, your time is coming, brother. Your time is coming. New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was among the lawmakers showing support at the rally, joining with independent Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, calling on Amazon to do better by its employees. You can go to space, you can give our workers a bathroom break, ain't that right? Yeah. If you can go to space, you can make sure that you're treating people well and giving them solid health care benefits. Yeah. That you don't have a three-hour commute to and from work. That they can afford the house that they can live in. That people don't have to be sleeping in their cars in order to work for Amazon. All of this is an indignity and an injustice and it has no place in New York City. And we're going to change that. And right here, our workers out here are going to change that. Later in the day, Senator Sanders joined a rally in Richmond, Virginia, in support of unionizing Starbucks workers. A bill making its way through the Connecticut General Assembly would protect workers from one of the tactics that employers use to prevent their workers from joining unions, that is, from attending employer-led meetings about politics, religion, or union organizing without fear of being disciplined or fired. Emily Scott reports. In particular, the legislation would provide workers the freedom to leave so-called captive audience meetings, which are often held by employers to provide information to workers during unionizing efforts. Connecticut AFL-CIO's Ed Hawthorne says employers sometimes use these meetings to intimidate workers and instill fear that a union would negatively affect their workplace. This bill is about respecting employees' beliefs and not allowing an employer's belief on politics, religion, and union organizing to be forced upon them. So this is why we believe now is the time in the wake of the great resignation to give a voice back to the workers so that they do feel respected in the workplace. The bill passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee on March 29th and is now on the Senate calendar. The Connecticut Business and Industry Association is among its critics, saying it could suppress workplace communications. The National Labor Review Board's general counsel said this month she will ask the board to find these mandatory meetings illegal. Jessica Petronella of United Food and Commercial Workers Local 371 in Fairfield County says at a Dollar General store in Barkhamstead, workers were told in meetings that if they were to unionize, the company would have to close the store. She thinks making meetings optional also would mean more fair elections. 
they scare them in those meetings by talking about dues, talking about assessments. And a lot of the information that they provide is not accurate. Though it's illegal to do that, to close the store for organizing, just having that in the back of your mind is incredibly intimidating. State Attorney General William Tong supports the bill. The Senate's Labor and Public Employees Committee recently advanced a bill that would provide unemployment benefits to striking workers. I'm Emily Scott with Connecticut News Service. 5,000 nurses at Stanford Healthcare and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital in Palo Alto went on strike today. 93% of union members authorized the job action over staffing levels and benefits. Nurses say they're overworked as the hospitals rely on overtime and they're burnt out after two years of a COVID pandemic. According to the nurses' union, Burnout and exhaustion are driving an increasing number of nurses to reconsider their profession. The hospital said it will cut the nurses' health care benefits for those who go on strike. Thousands of Sutter Health nurses waged a one-day strike last Monday to also demand better pay and working conditions. The mayors of some of the largest cities in California are calling on Governor Gavin Newsom to beef up funding for homeless services. Not just in budget surplus years, the mayors of Oakland, San Jose, Fresno, San Diego, and other cities traveled to Sacramento to make their pleas heard today. Daniel Witte reports. The mayors said flexible funding is approved annually, and they want a three-year funding commitment from the state. Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff says the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program, or HAP program, has allowed cities to come up with innovative ways to tackle the problem. In summary, in the first few years of flexible funding to California's big city mayors, we have served more than 25,000 of California's most vulnerable residents. Many of them we have prevented from falling into homelessness in the first place, and we have been able to move into permanent stable housing. We have used these funds to expand California's shelter capacity by roughly 9,000 more shelter beds. But most importantly, cities have continued to demonstrate that we are the centers of innovation. Schaff said the HAP program has helped major cities move 25,000 people out of housing or prevented at-risk people from falling into homelessness in the first place. At a news conference today in Sacramento, the mayors said the HAP funding has allowed cities to do things like add thousands of new shelter beds and build tiny cabins to house the homeless. San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria said he spoke with an elderly couple living out of their car in his city that took advantage of the city's safe parking program. There I met Rodolfo and Maria. Rodolfo and Maria uh, were, uh, became homeless after a rent increase they could not afford. Uh, they're both senior citizens. They moved into their car. Uh, they were living on the streets behind a Walmart uh, in our community uh, where they felt extremely unsafe. Uh, they mentioned hiding down in their car when they were here, things going on outside the vehicle that made them feel very threatened. And so at some point, someone shared with them that the city has launched safe parking uh, locations. And they quickly took up the opportunity to move to one. By sheltering there every single night, not only did they become safer, they didn't have the same concern because of the lighting, the security, the services that provided there, but those services meant that they got connected to permanent housing. Maria was sharing with me with tears in her eyes what it meant to get moved into a one-bedroom apartment in the city of San Diego, one that they can actually afford. Some mayors warned that without a stable funding source from the state, cities may have to dip into their reserves, which could mean cuts to other badly needed services like parks, public transit, infrastructure, and public safety. For KPFA News, I'm Daniel Witte. 
The United States Supreme Court today heard arguments about a former Washington State public high school football coach who wanted to kneel and pray on the football field after games. The high court is considering the First Amendment religious rights implications of whether it's appropriate for a public school employee to appear to promote a religion. Max Pringle reports. Under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, government institutions can't prohibit anyone from practicing their religion, nor can that institution push any particular faith. Former Bremerton High School coach Joe Kennedy said he was sacked for leading an on-field prayer after a couple of games, and that, he says, violates his First Amendment right to practice his faith. Kennedy's attorney, Paul Clement, said Kennedy was leading a small private prayer, which doesn't amount to pressuring anyone. It's very important to distinguish between real coercion coming from the government and the kind of peer pressure, if you will, that comes from private individuals being able to engage in speech. And I think the record is clear here that we only have the latter going on here and not the former. But Richard Katsky, the school district's lawyer, argued that the district tried to reach a compromise with Kennedy, wherein he could pray privately on his own. However, says Katsky, Kennedy didn't choose to lead a prayer in private, like in the dressing room or somewhere inconspicuous, but right on the 50-yard line of the field which, he argues, is a clear attempt to promote religion on school property. If that were the issue, there wouldn't be a case here because the district allowed that. But that wasn't good enough for Mr. Kennedy. He insisted on audible prayers at the 50-yard line with students. He announced in the press that those prayers are how he helps these kids be better people. And after the district closed the field to the public, he expressly permitted uh, legislators and others to join him. Justice Elena Kagan, one of the court's three liberals, said Kennedy's position as a coach gives him respect and authority among the students, who could feel pressure to join in his religious observations, even if they don't want to. Kennedy sued the district when it did not renew his contract. The district's decision has been upheld in lower courts, but the high court has a 6-3 conservative majority and is expected to rule for Kennedy in the case. The court is expected to decide on the case in June. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. A report issued today issues uh, urges a California coastal panel to deny a proposal to build a $1.4 billion desalination plant that would draw on the ocean to expand water sources in Southern California. Staff for the California Coastal Commission recommended the panel reject Poseidon Water's proposal to build the 50 million gallon a day facility at Huntington Beach. The project's up for discussion before the panel on May 12th. The project raises significant and complex coastal protection policy issues, the staff wrote in the report, including conformity with policies that require protection of marine life, water quality, environmentally sensitive habitat areas, and policies meant to avoid or minimize hazards associated with sea level rise, floods, tsunamis, and geological hazards. The staff wrote that the proposal also raises significant issues about potential impacts on environmental justice communities. Poseidon Water said it believed the commission staff erred in its recommendation. The proposal has been touted by some in California's Orange County as a solution to a long-running drought and a way to expand water sources as the region grows. Climate justice activists staged dozens of actions across the country over the weekend after Earth Day, demanding President Joe Biden do more to advance climate justice and live up to his campaign pledges. Thousands took to the streets and rallied in Washington, D.C., outside the White House. So I'm from California, where we don't have snow days. We have smoke. I'm from California, where we don't have snow days, we have smoke days. In the summer of 2020, the year of the orange skies, the smoke from the wildfires made it unsafe to go outdoors for over a month. I remember waking up one night, barely able to breathe, looking out my window and realizing I wasn't able to see across the street, the smoke was so thick. Our government has the ability to solve this crisis. Joe Biden and Congress have our future in their hands, and they also hold the tools to save us. 
But as it stands right now, our government is failing us. Biden promised to be a climate champion, but we're two years into his presidency, and he's approved more fossil fuel developments on public lands than Donald Trump. The fight for our future rally for climate change care jobs and justice actions also took place in Atlanta, Phoenix, and New York City, where activists blocked traffic at 6th Avenue and 42nd Street. Activists were arrested in New York on Earth Day for blocking the entry to the New York Times printing plant, saying the publication inadequately covers climate change issues. Morning clouds tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area should be sunny by the afternoon. Highs in the low 60s close to the Bay Inland, mostly sunny with a high of 70 degrees. Mostly cloudy in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the low 80s. And in Los Angeles tomorrow, partly cloudy, a high of 80 degrees. That's it for the news tonight. For this Monday, April 25th, I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Monday nights on KPFA and KPFA.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and KPFA.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24ABR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.